Good evening. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, the Executive Director of the Institute of Politics. It is such a pleasure to gather this evening for the IOP's annual David and Ann Broder Speaker Series program. You may know of David S. Broder as a Pulitzer Prize winning titan of political journalism who wrote for the Washington Post for more than 40 years and was a prolific TV news commentator with 400 appearances on Meet the Press. He was known as the Dean of the Washington Press Corps and was revered for his ability to cut through the noise of punditry and spin and for centering the voices of everyday voters in his reporting. You may not know that his career began here at the University of Chicago, where he earned a BA in 1947 and a master's in 1951, or that U Chicago is where he met his indomitable wife, Anne, who also graduated in 1951 and later was a force for democracy, good government and good schools in Virginia where they lived. The IOP is proud to know the Broder family as both benefactors and friends. Their generosity supports not only this annual conversation, which features a journalist who exemplifies David Broder's integrity, insight, and professionalism, but also the IOP's summer internship program, which gives students the opportunity to work in public service organizations around the world. Several of the Broder children are with us this evening, and we are honored to tip our caps to their parents who themselves are stellar representations of the IOP's mission of public service. Now I'd like to turn it over to Claire Capper, a fourth year in the college, who will introduce our guests. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this year's Broder Speaker Series event. I am delighted to introduce our featured guest today, Marty Barron. Dubbed the ultimate old school editor, Mr. Barron's tenure in journalism has spanned 45 years, which has included stints at the Miami Herald, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and the Boston Globe. Many of you in the audience may recognize Mr. Barron from Leah Schreiber's portrayal of him in the movie Spotlight, which tells the story of the Boston Globe's coverage of the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal, during which Mr. Barron was editor of the paper. In 2013, he became executive editor of the Washington Post. In his eight years in this position, the Washington Post earned 10 Pulitzers and became a leading national news outlet, boasting over 3 million digital subscribers. He additionally oversaw the Post's efforts for extensive coverage of the Trump administration, which ultimately helped to identify and fact check over 30,000 30, false and misleading statements. Under the slogan of democracy dies in darkness, the Washington Post under Mr. Barron has played an important role in providing truthful and quality reporting during a time in which journalism has been under attack and misinformation widespread. In February, 2001, Mr. Barron stepped down as executive editor of the Washington Post. Moderating the discussion today is David Axelrod. Mr. Axelrod currently serves as the director of the Institute of Politics and is a political commentator on CNN. He previously served as the chief strategist and senior advisor to President Obama and was a political writer for the Chicago Tribune. With that, please join me in welcoming tonight's guest, Marty Barron. Marty, good to see you. So happy to to have you here uh, tonight. What what an appropriate speaker for the for the Broder series, um, and we're just so pleased you're here. Thank you, David. Great to be here. And thanks to the Broder family. Um, uh, I was saying before we began that uh, to a journalist of of my generation, Dave Broder was a real role model, uh, and obviously he uh, was in many ways the face of the Washington Post. Uh, because of his extraordinary reporting over decades uh, uh, there. And we, we're so grateful for his example, and we're grateful to, to the Broder family for its support of the Institute uh, of Politics. And Marty, let's start there. You know, we, we were chatting before. Dave Broder was famous for jumping in a car and driving to wherever the political action was and knocking on doors and stopping in diners and uh, talking to people and really getting the pulse of, uh, of where America was. Um, but there were news cycles then and big, bigger budgets and news organizations, although the Post obviously is, isn't as hobbled by that now um, as some other news organizations. But talk to me about the changes. You, you began journalism in, in, the, in, the, in the mid to late 70s. 
talk to me about how this business has changed in the 45 years uh, that you practice journalists as a reporter and as the editor of three uh, major news organizations. Well, it's changed a lot. I mean, I think, uh, you know, when I started, uh, I started in 1976 working for the Miami Herald. Miami Herald at the time had two editions a day. Uh, there were many papers that I had only one edition a day. Uh, so they had an afternoon edition and a morning edition. Uh, and that's what you worried about. Uh, uh, now, of course, uh, we produce news uh, 24 hours a day uh, with great speed and under great pressure. Um, and we have competition from uh, just about everybody, uh, you know, in the past, let's say in, in the seventies, when I was at the Miami Herald, our competitor was the Miami News. That's it, um, essentially, and maybe TV a little bit, uh, but that's uh, that's about it. And maybe some a little bit up the coast, the Sun Sentinel in Florida uh, or the Palm Beach Post. Um, and there were some territories where people were competing. But uh, today we compete with essentially everybody uh, and every media outlet is in everybody else's business. And uh, especially with the onset of high-speed broadband um, uh, penetration in the early 2000s, uh, that changed everything. Uh, because then you saw the development of um, mobile devices. Uh, you saw the development of social media. The social media companies uh, didn't exist until the latter part of the uh, 2000s. And uh, that, is, that has had a dramatic impact on just about everything. I mean, the way that uh, uh, how, how people receive their information, the economics of the business, uh, the ability of individuals to um, to um, have a, 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 a an amplified voice on their own through social media. Uh, all of that has been a dramatic change to to our business. And you know, I, I noted that when you uh, when you announced your retirement uh, from uh, the post, you you said. You're 45 years and in, 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 in this new era, it, it gets exhausting. And the absence of news cycles, uh, I'm sure is, is part of that. What kinds of pressures does that put on reporters uh, and, and ed editors um, to constantly be refreshing copy, to be looking over both shoulders and in all directions to see where news is coming from and what you have to react to instantaneously and not just by the next morning. Right. Well, I mean, just by way of example, you know, at the Post, we we focused a lot on alerts, uh, letting people know through their mobile devices that news has occurred. Uh, and we actually measure that uh, very closely as to who's first. Are we first? Are we second? How far, how far behind are we from others? Uh, we look at our primary. We've looked at our primary competitors. That sort of thing uh, is necessary in the current environment from a business perspective, uh, and certainly, you know, readers notice it and they say, "That's great. You're getting me the news before anybody else does." But that sort of thing puts an enormous amount of pressure on journalists uh, to turn things around as, as quickly as possible. And so you put the alert out, then you're developing the story all along the way. Uh, what you see online. Uh, or on your app is a story in development almost all, all of the time. Um, in the past, that would have been a story that, you know, you would develop it at seven o'clock. You might finish it, give it to your editor, or go through a, an assignment editor or a copy editor, uh, maybe several, uh, and then it would be published uh, the next morning. Uh, now that that sort of speed is being, is, it's intense, uh, it's being measured there. We have metrics that are applied against that. And, um, and uh, we're expected to respond to you know news from all all sources because we face competition from all sources. Otherwise, it looks like we're not on top of things. We'll we'll get to your um, uh, do doppelganger, Lee, Lee Schreiber, in a minute. But um, you are uh, you know you're known in the business for someone who wherever you've gone, you've you've taken on you know, big stories, uh, stories that if you got them wrong, uh, would be uh, devastating for your paper and career ending for you. Um, so how do you how do you operate in an environment in which, I mean, obviously on the big stories, you still have time to develop them, exclusive stories, but uh, is, the, uh, is the prospect of mistakes greater today? I mean, it must be a huge concern given the timeframes in which your reporters are working. Well, I think it is. I mean, I think that uh, we had more time to sort of sit back, ask a lot of questions, uh, not worry so much about the competition, posting something before 
uh, before we do. Uh, I think we've seen some examples of that uh, recently. There were some pretty big, uh, pretty big errors that were made recently. And, um, and I think that's largely a result of speed and the inability to sort of double check, triple check um, uh, under, under pressure. Not the inability, but the fact that maybe people didn't do as much as they should have. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, that, it, that there's just this, it's a very, it's a very different environment. I mean, and it's also a different environment because of just the, so, the social media. And, um, and so, you know, you mentioned one of the big stories, which for me, a big one was the investigation of the Catholic Church in Boston. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think back on that, and I'm, I feel like it's a stroke of luck that we didn't have social media at the time, because um, uh, we did have the internet, and it actually helped um, amplify that story and get that story to people all around the country and all around the world in a way that would not have been possible prior to the internet. So, you know, there's a professor at NYU by the name of Clay Shirky who calls it, called it super distribution of a story. And in many ways, it was the first sort of internet amplified uh, investigation. Uh, but we didn't have social media. And, uh, and I'm glad because uh, it's quite possible that somebody on the staff would have uh, gone on uh, Twitter or wherever it might be, said something that however accurate and however morally justified uh, would have adopted a different tone than we wanted for the stories that we did. Uh, we took great care on how we wrote those stories. Uh, I stripped it as reflected in the movie. Uh, I stripped it of every adjective I could find, any bit of colorful language, I, because I felt the evidence was, the documentation was so strong. I didn't want the church to seize on anything uh, to try to discredit us. And I thought they would if we used language that seemed to uh, inflate things in any way. And so, uh, but you know, you can't control what people are going to say on social media. And so I'm very glad that they, we didn't have that distraction at the time. And we just let the reporting just spoke for itself. And, um, and, and the reporting in that instance uh, spoke volumes. What, what kinds of conversations did you have in the last uh, eight years with your reporters at the post about social media and about uh, cable television appearances and so on, in which they encouraged to express uh, opinions. Right. Well, it's been a source of, uh, for me, it was a source of conflict and tension at uh, the post, as, as has been widely reported. Um, you know, my problem is not so much with cable television, uh, where, you know, I think that people understand they're not supposed to do or say things that do not meet the standards uh, of the post and the kinds of standards that we would apply uh, with 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 our own with our own stories. Uh, social media people, for some reason, feel that they have more liberty on social media than they do when they appear on television or radio, or when they're engaged in a public speaking uh, commitment. And so, um, and uh, people feel that it's you know it's their space to say kind of what they want. Uh, it's a reflection of their identity or their soul or however they put it. And, um, and, you know, we do have standards. We, at the Post, we have had standards that apply to that. They were, they, were, they were written a long time ago and they certainly need to be updated. But the basic point is that people should exercise uh, caution. They should exercise care and restraint um, in what they do. They, they can reflect more of their personality. They can reflect some wit, some in, extra insights, uh, things like that. Basically, they have to stay within, you know, certain boundaries. Um, and uh, there have been instances where we felt that people uh, exceeded those boundaries, boundaries, and and that's been a source of uh, a source of tension. And less so on cable television. There are very few instances where that I can recall. And in fact, on social media, there are still relatively few instances, given the thousands of tweets that are that uh, post reporters have uh, have put up. But um, but when when we do have differences, they tend to get. Um, they tend to become bigger, big issues uh, and sources of uh, of real conflict and tension about what's what's appropriate. You know, even when I was uh, working in the business, uh, there was, uh, you know, I saw this growing tension uh, between news as a trust and news as a business, uh, and that tension has been magnified dramatically because of all the competitive pressures that you uh, that you spoke of. Uh, and the pressure to get clicks and eyeballs. You mentioned the metrics that uh, you uh, uh, that 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 you were uh, uh, constantly um, uh, bombarded by. 
to um, to measure your success. And I'm sure in, in your mind, success is the quality of the story, the stories that you wrote. But um, how, how, did, how, does, how do you balance in the modern era um, that sort of sense of mission uh, and the pressures of, of business? Well, you look, I mean, like, we're not the only institution like that. I mean, universities are an institution like that. Uh, in, universities want to do, do good and they have a, a, a social mission, but at the same time, they are a business. They have to make enough money in order to pay uh, the salaries of people like yourself and others. And uh, otherwise they won't be able to fulfill the mission. The same is true of hospitals and, and any number, any nonprofit for that matter, uh, still has to have enough money coming in in order to execute its own, its own mission. So, um, um, you know, I mean, I think that um, we, we need to have a successful business. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to be able to fulfill our mission. We're not going to be able to afford reporters. We're not going to be able to allow, to allow them to do the kind of reporting that you were just talking about. It's going deep on stories, traveling the country, talk, knocking on doors, uh, spending time on, on stories, doing major investigations, writing important uh, and, and meaningful narratives all of that, uh, we wouldn't be able to afford that. On the other hand, we should never, as, as a uh, business, do anything that undermines our core principles. Um, and we do have, a, at the Post, we have a set of core principles, as does every uh, reputable news organization. And, uh, you know, at the Post is, the first one is to tell the truth as nearly as the truth may be ascertainable. And there's another principle that says that, uh, you know, that the the, the post exists not to serve the interests of the owner, but to serve the interests of the public. And, and I think it's really important that uh, news organizations stick to those kinds of principles. And if we don't, uh, then the public will know of that and it will actually undermine the business uh, because our business is, the foundation of our business is our credibility and our integrity and our independence. And uh, if we do anything that uh, violates the spirit of that, then uh, it will not only hurt us in terms of our reputation, our professional reputation, as well it should, uh, but it will hurt our business because the public uh, has expects us to live up to high standards, and if we fail in that regard, then it will then they will abandon us. This uh, you much of your eight years uh, at the Post, certainly five of them uh, from the uh, advent of Trump to the end of his presidency, has really uh, put put that to the test. Uh, this whole issue of trust, because his his project, and I don't think this is a particularly partisan point. He's he was pretty clear about it. His project was to cast doubt about the uh, uh, about uh, the trustworthiness of the news media. Told Leslie Stahl in a conversation uh, right before he took office that he wanted to uh, discredit the news media because he didn't want them to. If they wrote negative things about him, he didn't want people to believe them. He was pretty successful at that, at least with his base, was he not? I mean, we're seeing some um, we're seeing some reverberations of that even today in the view that people have of the last election. I, I think he that may be his uh, greatest success. Actually, is that he has undermined the idea that there are independent arbiters of fact and of truth. Um, the press was his uh, first and prime his primary target. His regular target. We were always available to him, uh, but he had other targets too. Uh, I think we saw that during the pandemic. It wasn't just the press. It was uh, leading scientific and health authorities as well. And uh, he questioned their objectivity, their accuracy, even though these were individuals who had spent their entire careers um, uh, advancing the public health, had a record of that, uh, had made the United States one of the uh, safest, healthiest countries in the world, um, and yet he would challenge. He challenged their credentials, um, and basically argued. And this was true of judges. I mean, we saw that mm -hmm. uh, after the election. Questioned the motives of the judges, their their credentials to actually pass judgment on uh, the uh, integrity of the election. On anybody, anybody who would contradict him, uh, he would question their their capacity to serve as an independent arbiter of fact. Um, and so, um, and that, and his idea of, um, of truth is just believe whatever I say. Um, and 
you know, I think that he has had success with that, particularly with his followers. And uh, that's been really disturbing. And I think where the problem is, and, and, you know, frankly, there's a bit of that going on on the left as well. I think that we live in an environment where, um, you know, there was a Republican pollster, Frank Luntz, who said that, you know, Trump supporters want to uh, be affirmed. They don't want to be informed. Right. Uh, and I think that's not just true of, of Republican voters, by the way. I think that's true of a lot of people in society today. They just want to be told that that the that the their pre-existing point of view is exactly right, uh, and they um, and so you know being informed means being told that uh, sometimes being told things that you didn't know or that you you where you had you had a different view when you started, but you're willing to go where the evidence leads you, and uh, now we can't even agree on um, on what. Uh, what a fact. It's not that we just can't agree on the facts. It's that we can't even agree on what constitutes a fact um, and what are the elements uh, in determining what a fact is. You know, normally you would rely on things like education, experience, uh, expertise, and evidence, above all evidence. Uh, but all of those things have been devalued and dismissed. Um, and some people want to say, well, the only thing I rely on is the person who I consider to be the person who is I follow, uh, the person who with whom I am ideologically aligned. Uh, and that's a dangerous place to be, I think, for a democracy. And it's not just a challenge for the press, it's a challenge for society as a whole. And it's not just a, a challenge for America, but we're seeing democracies all over the world being challenged. I have to ask you a personal uh, question related to this. I know that your parents were, uh, you know, fled Germany in the mid in the mid thirties um, and, um, and, and moved to, uh, uh, to I Israel and I, then Paris then came here. Is that, did I get the history right? Yeah, not, not exactly. I mean, my father left Germany in 1937 with his parents. So he was able to um, escape the Holocaust. Um, and, uh, but I don't know what I would call it fleeing, but they, they, they got out of there uh, and they went to what was then Palestine. You can't stop editing, can you? I can't. It was Palestine after the first mandate. <laughs> this, uh, my mother was my mother was born in what was then Palestine and later became Israel. And then they they went to Paris for two years and then came to the United States in 1954. Now the reason I ask the question, and you probably glean this, is um, you know there there we saw what happened in Germany in the in the uh, 30s, where um, where the the state substituted its uh, interpretation of facts, and be, it became uh, why broadly accepted uh, sort of dogma. Um, what, what? Tell me how concerned you are about the state of our democracy, and how concerned you are about um, resistance to. You've spent your life trying to find, as you say, in pursuit of the truth, in sharing facts, in shining a bright light in dark corners, uh, and. Uh, how how concerned are you now about the about the state of our democracy and about the ability of the news media and journalists to do their job and to be heard and trusted? I would say my level of concern is pretty high. Um, I mean, I um, I think that you know we do live in a very right now. It's not just a uh, polarized environment. I think it's highly tribal. Um, and I, I actually think it's uh, essentially what we're seeing are sectarian divisions, uh, emerging sectarian divisions, and we've already, that we've already seen um, sectarian violence of a sort. Um, and I think that's really worrisome because uh, we've seen that sort of thing in other countries, and I worry if our, if our country is headed in, in that direction. Um, there is a lot of distrust. Uh, there's distrust of the press. Uh, there's distrust of institutions generally. Mm -hmm. uh, and this uh, in our society today, um, I mean, look, we've got a there's distrust of the medical establishment. I mean, people won't take a vaccine, uh, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, and uh, because of a level of distrust in the in the medical establishment, there's distrust in just about every institution in the United States. There used to be, um, and some and, and much of it is is justified. The institutions have failed in many in many different ways. On the other hand, if you don't, if you have a society where you don't have institutions that are strong, and that where people are committed to strengthening those institutions, making them better, uh, then you have anarchy. And uh, and so um, 
I, I do worry about that. I mean, I'm not predicting that, but I, but I do worry about that. And I do think that the press has a huge challenge ahead of it in terms of uh, persuading people that the work that it's doing, that the work that it's done is uh, a, 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 uh, an effort to really get at the facts and to get at, to get at the truth. So, um, well, in, yeah, all those, in all those metrics that you uh, studied, um, you must have had a pretty strong sense of who was reading the Washington Post. How much did the Post reach outside that silo that you spoke of uh, uh, among sort of progressive, um, uh, you know, Democratic voters? Well, we tried. We tried very hard. I mean, I think that, um, you know, we, even in our, you know, our efforts to be on radio and television, which was really our kind of our marketing plan, uh, since we didn't have a really big marketing budget, it's to be as, as, as present as we possibly could. There was a real special effort on the part of the Post to appear on radio stations in red states uh, and on television stations in red states. And uh, we actually were doing a lot more of that. And so, and we were willing to make people available regardless of uh, where these stations were located. Uh, so, um, you know, but people are drawn, people, we can't control what people subscribe to. We can't right. control what the people read. And so uh, it's fairly clear that, look, what, look what happened to Fox uh, when it, you know, after it called Arizona for Joe Biden uh, and after Trump went after Fox because of that accurate call um, right. is that they started abandoning Fox and going to Newsmax and One American News Network uh, because they were, because those, those outfits were, uh, you know, asserting that uh, the election was uh, somehow stolen and illegitimate and uh, you name it, uh, whatever conspiracy theory there was. Um, and so people abandoned Fox of all places, which was among the most trusted sources for people on the right. Uh, and in an instant, they were they were leaving it. Yeah, uh, because they're working hard to get them back now. Yeah. Well, they'll get them back, but they're getting them back by doing what essentially right. by doing essentially what uh, what uh, Newsmax was doing, um, and by spreading doubts about the election, by spreading doubts about um, measures to combat the pandemic, uh, like masks and what happened, the vaccination and all that sort of stuff. So they're getting them back by doing by replicating what those other outlets uh, were doing. So, so um, what you're saying is, uh, look, I. I, I have ultimate respect for your integrity and the integrity of the newspaper. What you're saying is it's very, very hard to get outside the silo. It's very, very hard to expand beyond, beyond a natural tribe that gravitates, uh, no matter how much, how assiduously uh, you and professionally you do your work. It is hard. I mean, I think that we should still work at it. I mean, I think that. Um, there's some things that we should always try to do. And one is I think we need to show more of our work. Uh, you know, if we're referring to, let's say, court decisions regarding the election, uh, these challenges to the election, let's show the court ruling. Let's show what the judge wrote. Uh, point people to the, the, the uh, appropriate, to the relevant language in the, in the document. Uh, if there's a video that shows what's happened, let's, let's say January 6th. I mean, those videos are exceptionally powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and they contradict the idea that you know this this you know assertion on the part of uh, Trump uh, that you know these individuals were uh, hugging and kissing the police. They clearly were not hugging and kissing the police. They were doing exactly the opposite. Uh, they were assaulting them. Uh, and so uh, the videos are very powerful. So we need to show those things all of the time. And then I think we also have the obligation as a national news organization at the Post and other national news organizations to make sure that we get out in the country and that we listen to people and we listen empathetically to what their concerns are, what their aspirations are, um, and that they feel that, uh, that we took them seriously, that we're not, uh, you know, we're not being condescending uh, and that and they may not, may not agree with every story we have. I don't expect them to do, to do that. I, we're not, our job is not to pander and to placate, but our job is definitely to listen and, and to listen openly to everybody in this country. And, um, and so I think we should, uh, you know, we should make sure we do that. You know, when you went to the Post, you went to the Globe 
and you encountered a really difficult uh, f financial situation. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm sure, in addition to your brilliance as an editor, that they were eager to have you is that you also have an MBA and you have some understanding of uh, business and uh, and they had a business challenge as regional papers do all over the country. When you were hired by the Post, they were one of those regional papers in many ways. Uh, and you probably, and you had a cut staff, what, 40% at the Globe. Uh, you, you probably went to the Post with the expectation that you were gonna have to take a, a, a sharp pencil to try and protect reporting and yet live within a budget. And then, um, and then the wealthiest man in the world bought your newspaper. You probably didn't know that was going to happen when you took the job. How much, I mean, that, that clearly changed everything. And I know you've made the point, not just because of the resources, that was almost beside the point, what, but he brought a whole new orientation to your, to your paper. T talk about that. I'm talking about Jeff Bezos, but just just for Bezos anyone who has, hasn't been on this planet lately. Yeah, well, I mean, look, the first thing he did when he came in is that he, and I did, did not have any idea this was going to happen. Uh, it was a total surprise to me, but um, as it was to just about everybody. Um, and, you know, the first thing he did is he said he wanted to change the strategy of the Post. Um, that the strategy we had, which was being a regional paper, may have been right in the past, it probably was, could make a lot of money at it, uh, but that it, there wasn't really a model for that today. Uh, but that we had this incredible opportunity. Um, while we had suffered all the damage that could be done by the, uh, by the internet, it had destroyed every economic pillar of our business, uh, it was also giving us this gift. And uh, the gift was, uh, national and worldwide distribution at, 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 at very little additional cost uh, because it was going to be digital as opposed to a physical newspaper. And we had the opportunity to take advantage of that because we were in the nation's capital, which is a really good base uh, for having a national newspaper, obviously. Yeah. Uh, it had a name, the Washington Post, which is the kind of name you would want. You can't necessarily have a national paper called uh, you know, the Boston Globe or the Miami Herald or something like that. Doesn't make or sense. Or the Chicago Tribune. Um, or the Chicago Tribune, right? So, and and you know, and thirdly, we had this identity um, going back to uh, Watergate of shining a light in dark corners, of being investigative, of um, and uh, holding government accountable. Uh, that um, there was still, you know, in the minds of the public, even though even those people who had never read the Washington Post ever, um, and so here was an opportunity for us to sort of become national. And then he, and you know, and and so then the question is, what are what were our ideas for for going national? And we came with our ideas, and he had some ideas of his own, and we worked them out, and we, and he funded them, um, and um, and so yes, the money mattered. It's not it wasn't incidental, uh, but it had to be it had to be money that was uh, in support of a, a strategy, uh, because we had money before, and the money was going into the wrong strategy, and we were failing. Uh, so it's not just a matter of money. The strategy has to be the right one, and so we started to do that, and and uh, we continue. The post continues to do that, and uh, it worked, and uh, it worked quite well. It worked very quickly, as a matter of fact. I mean, within the first year of his ownership, uh, the digital traffic to the Washington Post was up something like sixty-four percent, um, and because of the initiatives that we that we undertook, and they were digitally oriented and nationally oriented, and and one of the other things he wanted us to do was to orient the post to to a younger audience, uh, because he said, if we didn't cultivate a younger audience, then we wouldn't have one in 20 years. Now, that's the first time I ever heard an owner of a news, uh, news organization or a, um, a publisher ever talk about 20 years. By the, at that point, after having worked in the business for many decades, uh, the only thing I had heard of was like maybe next year or the next quarter. Uh, and so you can only imagine how refreshing it was to hear somebody talk about what we're going to be in 20 years. Yeah, you must have felt like you died and went to heaven. Yeah, I was like, what happened here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it's not, and you've pointed this out, it's not a strategy that these other papers, can, the, the Herald or the Tribune or the Globe can employ. And we do have this, uh, uh, we have really a crisis in local journalism as we sit here today, by the end of this month, um, a, a hedge fund uh, group, Alden, may may uh, take the Chicago Tribune private and, and their pattern all over the country has been to 
essentially starve newsrooms. Um, this is a matter of great concern here. First of all, how how big a concern is that from the standpoint of our democracy as well as journalism, not just the Chicago situation, but it's being replicated all over the country. And what 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 is the answer to it? Uh, well, I can I can answer the first question. I'm not sure I have an answer to the second one, but um, I think it's a serious problem. I mean, I think that democracy really begins at the local level. I mean, people need to know what's happening with their police. They need to know what's happening at their city council, with the county commission, uh, with the school board, uh, with their local environment, uh, whatever it might be, planning board, you name it. Um, and uh, local, local news organizations, particularly local newspapers, have been the source of that information. They are one of the things that binds those communities together. And as these news, as these news organizations are suffering, and many of them going out of business, leaving what are called you know, news deserts, uh, other organizations, other institutions are suffering as a result because, particularly cultural institutions, because nobody has any idea what they're doing. Um, and, um, and they're not sufficiently effective in using other means in order to, to reach a broader audience. And so one of these things that brings the community together is, is a newspaper. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's really serious. Um, and, and by the way, I mean, it's like, we think we call these local, but the reality is that many of these issues at the local level are really national in scope. They just have, we just happen to be covering them at the local level. So- Well, you know, your investigation of the Catholic church is, right. is, a, is a prime right. example. Example, that. that was happening throughout the country and by the way, throughout the world. Uh, but look what's happened. If you look at what's happening, let's say with police, uh, policing in the country, Yes, these things are happening at the local level because police are a local entity. Uh, that said, these problems are bigger, um, and and so, and that's that's true. You took the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. That's not just an issue in Flint. That's an issue in communities throughout this country. Jackson, Mississippi. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. This is the we can't wait until these things get to the get get to Congress. I mean, frankly, if they're not even covered at the local level, they may never get to Congress. And so um, that's how we start discovering these things is at the grassroots level. And so I think that's really critical. As to what we do about that, you know, I think it's really hard. Um, I mean, fundamentally, I think that, uh, you know, it's one would hope that the public will start to will begin to understand what they're what they're at risk of losing and start to support these organizations. I do think that uh, local newspapers have to charge for their uh, charge for their journalism, and then in, in exchange, uh, local news organizations, newspapers have to provide uh, real value. Uh, nobody's going to pay for something that they don't value. Uh, so it's incumbent on these news organizations to provide coverage that is really um, uh, that's really that's really treasured by the the, the community and. Those, each individual news organization has to figure that out for itself. Um, if, you know, uh, play, entities like Alden, you know, hedge funds like Alden take over, then I would hope that there would be, let's say, nonprofit news organizations or other private enterprises that would emerge uh, that would start to do the job right. I think we're starting to see that in some communities. It's, it's nascent. Uh, it's uncertain. Uh, there's no guarantee of success. Uh, some of these out outfits are a little wobbly. Uh, but uh, there are also, you know, efforts to support them, and um, and some, you know, efforts like, you know, I mean, uh, I just did an event with the American Journalism Project, which is a uh, an effort to raise money at the national level to support uh, primarily nonprofit uh, journalism um, throughout the country, and um, and 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 find sustainable business models for these uh, for these nonprofits. And, and we've seen we've seen. Uh some uh, nascent uh, efforts that are showing real promise here. Uh, there's a organization called Bridge Michigan that is doing right. really, really good work um, right. every every single day. There's a Block Club Chicago is another uh, group. And uh, it's a combination of subscription and foundation uh, support. And as right. uh, Bezos uh, pointed out to you, when you when you're a digital operation, you're removing like 80% of your fixed costs. So if you just yeah. are pouring the money into the journalism and you can, you know, you can make it pencil out, that's, that's, uh, um, that's exciting. I mean, um, it, one has to hope uh, that that, uh, that becomes more and more 
robust in these places where we're losing traditional uh, news operations. You know, I was thinking about uh, all your tremendous successes at the Miami Herald, uh, Elian Gonzalez, uh, the, uh, you uh, invest a lot of the company's money in actually redoing the recount in, uh, in 2000. And interestingly, found that the right result was, uh, was reported, which was that Bush probably would have run one if every ballot had been uh, uh, been counted, the globe we've talked about that uh, you uh, take took a great risk when you arrived at the post by uh, publishing the Edward Snowden uh, story, and then obviously throughout the. Uh, but so you've got a lot of things to be proud of. Looking back, what's your greatest regret? What's the biggest mistake that you think you've made in in, in forty five years, and 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 what did you learn from it? Well, I don't know what the biggest is, but the freshest is, you know, obviously at the Post, I think we, there was a, a reckoning after the George Floyd killing. Uh, and uh, there was a reckoning in the country on matters of race. There was a reckoning within newsrooms on a matter of race. Uh, the Post actually had a quite diverse newsroom um, and we worked very hard at that, uh, but it was clear, became clear. We had a reckoning in our own newsroom that we hadn't done enough, that we hadn't, we didn't have enough uh, journalists of color and more senior positions. Uh, and that we needed to dedicate more resources to covering uh, issues of race, ethnicity, and identity. Um, and, um, and so because we had so much competence, I mean, you know, you've recounted a little bit about what we were up against at the, at the post. Uh, we were trying to turn the ship around, uh, keep it from sinking, actually. Um, and so there were so many needs at the post uh, that we had that uh, I think our attention was on all of those things. And, and uh, we and I uh, lost sight of the need to really uh, do more in the area of, cover of coverage of race, ethnicity, and identity, and also to make sure that we, uh, that journalists of color felt that they, uh, that we were doing enough to advance their careers, <clears throat> that we were putting people in leadership positions uh, and all of that. And so, do I wish I had done more in that regard? Absolutely. Um, actually, the first question we, we had was on this subject. Um, and uh, it was, we talked a lot about newsroom diversity, especially when it comes to recent coverage of race and politics. But what do you think is the one thing this industry needs to work on in terms of bringing in journalists other than diversity? Other than sorry, what, the, what's the question now? I'm sorry. It, it's other than diversity. Uh, uh, other than diversity, what kinds of people do you need to bring into oh. the newsroom? Well, I mean, I actually do think of diversity in a broader sense. I mean, that's not not to set aside the issues of race, ethnicity, and identity, but uh, I do think we need just a variety of people in our newsroom. I mean, I we I talked earlier about making sure that we cover the entirety of the country and understand and listen. And it's really helpful to have it in our newsrooms, people who bring a lot of different perspectives. Now, I mean, I, I think there are many stereotypes about the people who work in newsrooms uh, that, you know, we all went to sort of elite colleges, that we come from the East Coast or whatever, that people didn't grow up in, you know, red state America or whatever it might be. But that's just really not the case. You know, we have people on our staff who grew up on family farms. We have people who've served in the military. We have people who grew up in evangelical households. Some were homeschooled. We have uh, people who are refugees uh, to the United States. We have a whole wide range of people. Uh, but that said, I mean, I think that we can still do more work in terms of uh, broadening it. One of the areas that I had a particular interest in was to make sure we had veterans working in our newsroom more uh, because we had relatively few. And so, uh, I mean, look, we've been at war in Afghanistan for 20 years. Uh, and only now are the troops going to be fully brought home. Um, and um, and how many people do we have in newsrooms who've actually fought in a war? How many people have actually been in the military, uh, served in the military? Very few. Um, and um, and that's, that's a big part of the American experience at this point. And I, I think that uh, it's really important. It used to be that we had a lot more because there was a draft. And, you know, in the old days, there were a lot of people in our newsrooms who had been drafted. And so they'd served in the military. Now we don't have that. And I think that's, 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 a, that's a big gap. And I think there are any number of other, other places I think we should, the one area that I don't, I think we should ask about is we don't ask people's political opinions because I, political opinions to me are not 
I'm not at, I'm not interested in their political opinion. I want them to. I'm interested in whether they can be a good journalist. Um, and so, as far as I'm concerned, they can have, you know, uh, whatever their political opinion is. Uh, and um, it, it, you know, as long as, as long as people aren't violating the core principles that we have in journalism. So, and uh, which is respect for all people is one of them. So, uh, so um, that's not an area that I would want that I would even bother asking about. But uh, but every everything else, I think we should expand the kind of people we have in our newsroom. I've got a question from Maddie Saskin, and I will ask it in one second. But I'd be I'd be remiss. I should have asked it earlier when I was asking you uh, about uh, the ownership of the Post. How uh, uncomfortable was it when you had to cover Amazon, which is a huge entity in our uh, in our country and in the world? Um, you know, um, Bezos said at the beginning, his first town hall with the staff, uh, he said uh, with the new staff, he, answered, he was asked that question. He said, cover Amazon any way you want, cover me any way you want. And, uh, and he reiterated that to me on multiple occasions. And I never heard from him on any story that we did about Amazon or about him, uh, you know, himself, uh, anything on that. So it didn't, you know, after a while, I realized I'm not going to hear from him. And so, you know, we'll do what we've been doing all along. We're just going to keep covering Amazon and uh, him anyway, the way we would anybody else. And um, I never heard from him about it. I respect him for that. I think that's really admirable. Um, and um, he gives us our independence. And, um, and I have no reason to believe that that won't continue. Um, and nobody, and uh nobody ever pushed a story across your desk and said um, uh, chief, chief you better take a look at this one it's it's a, it, it may uh, it may be bothersome uh, about a lot of other subjects they have uh, <laughs> but not I would expect him. them I would expect them to use the same standards uh you know with Amazon if it's if it, you know if it's a story that we would normal that normally I would review then I would want to expect to see it. If it's not a story that I would normally review, then I don't expect to see it. So we're not going to exclude my, uh, I mean, I'm not there anymore, but we're not going to exclude my review of the story simply because it's Amazon. On the other hand, I'm not going to review it simply because it's Amazon. Uh, so Maddie's question was, what can we as news consumers do to help local journalism succeed? Well, first, pay for it. Uh, subscribe. I mean, that's the first thing is that somebody needs to subscribe. I mean, I remember when um, when I was in Boston and we finally implemented a paywall at, at the Boston Globe, first time we had digital subscriptions. Um, I met with our summer interns, all of whom were college students. Uh, and they said, well, that's great that you're doing it, but you know, college students, we can't afford a subscription. And I said, well, that's not true. And they looked at me like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, how much do you spend on beer every week? Uh, and so, uh, and they all laughed. And I said, how much do you spend on a cup of coffee? Uh, and they said, it's not that you can't afford it. It's that you've made a choice that you're not going to pay for it because you're paying for other things. And, and you value your cup of coffee or your bottle of beer uh, over a newspaper subscription, which is not that expensive, by the way. So um, I think the first thing to do is to, to, is to pay for it and encourage other people to as well. Otherwise, you're simply not going to have quality journalism. Um, we have a question from Sophie Hare, and I think she's going to ask it herself. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Sophie. I'm a second year in the college. I was just wondering what advice you would give to young reporters who would like to have a career like yourself. Um, well, you know, I mean, I um, advice can run across a lot of different things. The first thing that I would encourage people to do is if you're passionate about it and you think you'll be good at it, do it regardless of what anybody else says, like including your parents, uh, about you know what the opportunities would be because we can't really predict the opportunities. The reality is that a lot of people are just looking at what's happened to traditional news organizations, but there are a lot of new outlets out there that are doing really interesting work and, and they're providing a lot of opportunities. And young people who, who uh, are willing to do what needs to be done in a digital environment, but also have good, strong journalistic skills, uh, really have an opportunity to leapfrog over other people. Um, and uh, and if you're passionate about it and you're good at it, then I would say do it. 
The other thing, point that I would make, and this was sort of addressed earlier in the conversation, and that is that I think, I always say that it's really important to be more impressed with what you don't know than with what you do know or what you think you know. Uh, we should always be intellectually curious. Journalists should always be constant learners. We should always understand that we, uh, that we go into stories uh, seeking answers, not presuming that we already know the answers. And, um, and so I think that's, uh, that's really important. And then on the technical front, is this sort of understand, um, uh, I mean, do all the, all, the, all the basic journalistic practices of how to report and write and interview and all of that are really important, but also understand that the way that uh, stories are being told is changing, uh, that the tools that we're using are different, uh, that we now have access to video, audio, interactive graphics, uh, uh, animations, annotations, uh, you name it, all these things, and that we can enhance uh, the power of storytelling by taking advantage of all of those. You don't have to be an expert in all of them, but you have to sort of understand um, understand the media the media ecosystem e ecosystem right now. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, you and Lou, who is a second year in the college, and I think he's going to ask his own question. Hello, my name is Ewan. I'm a second year in college, and I'm just wondering who are some up and coming reporters that you admire? Up and coming reporters that I admire? I'll get into trouble if I answer that question because then the ones that I really, that I don't mention are going to get really upset. So um, why don't I take a pass on that? So, what are the, uh, what are the qualities uh, that you see that you, that cause you to admire the unnamed reporters? That they do what I was just talking about is that they um, that they don't presume that they know the the answers to the story before they uh, before they start. That they are they they do good um, uh, on the ground reporting. They talk to a lot of people. Uh, they do, they cultivate sources uh, really well. Uh, they are fair and how and how they approach their stories. They are open minded, willing to listen. But then when they've done their work, when they've when they've really done their work, they've done their research, they're also not afraid to tell the public what it is they've actually learned. Um, and um, uh, so that's, that's, that's the approach that I like. Um, the uh, next uh, question is from Leigh Breslau. He doesn't want to appear on video. Uh, so here's his question. Do you have any concerns or comments uh, regarding issues of free speech versus disinformation in social media? and whether such disinformation should be censured? Well, I mean, it's a complicated subject. It's really hard to answer in a, in, in a simple process. I mean, I've agreed now to be part of something that, uh, uh, that Jeff Thome, the University of Chicago, and, uh, and Lee Bollinger at, uh, at, uh, at Columbia are doing, uh, looking into that issue. Um, um, I mean, it's the... It's really hard. I mean, if you understand how these social networks really work, I mean, uh, they would have to have like a massive tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of editors uh, looking at every every piece. I mean, there the amount of content on YouTube, the amount of content on Facebook, the amount of content on Twitter, uh, on Reddit, on you name it, uh, and all these other places, uh, is enormous. Uh, how anybody could possibly monitor all of that is just it's, it's inconceivable to me. Um, on the other hand, I do think that the area that probably, I'm not an expert on this, I hope to become more expert on it, the area that uh, we should be focusing more of our attention is on the role of algorithms, how things become viral, um, what, are, what, are the, what is the impact of the algorithms, and to what extent, I'm not sure we'll get to the point where we can sort of uh, control every piece of content that is put on social networks, but I do think that we can exercise, and the tech platforms can exercise greater control over the extent to which misinformation of how how things go viral and so um and so that's the area that i would i, I think we ought to be focusing on do you agree uh with facebook and with the, all the platforms decisions to uh to remove trump from from the district? yeah well you know i mean um you know, Trump was spreading a lot of lies. I mean, that's that's the reality, and he was incorrigible, frankly. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's a rational decision on their part and a reasonable decision on their part. And he's indicated he's, he's certainly not indicated that he plans to stop doing that. In fact, he's getting worse. 
uh, in many ways. And so, uh, because it is getting worse because all of the evidence points to the fact that it was a legitimate election, that, that Joe mm -hmm. Biden was, uh, was elected in an election of complete of integrity. Uh, and, um, and some 60 judges have, uh, or 60 courts and uh, have, have found you know, these allegations to be bogus. And yet he continues to perpetuate this idea that uh, it was a stolen election. Um, he, he and many others. He and many uh, others, but he's the leader of the pack, so. Alfred Miller will ask the last question. I just want to return to something you mentioned earlier about um, not really uh, asking what your, your journalist political opinions are. Do, just out of curiosity, do, do, do you think their opinions are reflective of you know, those of the broader population? And if not, is that a problem? Thanks. Do I think that, that, that the opinions in the newsroom are equal to what's in the broader population? Yes, and is, if not, is it a problem? Mm -hmm. No, because I mean, right now we have about a third of the country that believes the election was uh, illegitimate. Do I think that a third of our newsroom should believe that the election was illegitimate? No, I don't, because the facts point in a different direction. So, um, um, you know, do I think that, you know, in newsrooms that it's reflective of the population as a whole? No, I don't, probably not, um, almost certainly not. But I can't really control for that. I mean, I basically, my, my view is that I, what I can control for is how, what, what kind of journalism are they practicing? And when it comes to political opinions about, you know, let's say, well, let's say the election or vaccinations or things like that, do I think that our newsroom should be reflecting those, that, that we should have people in our newsroom who hold that point of view that, you know, uh, that the vaccine, that the fact that the people shouldn't be vaccinated? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Do I think that people should, a third of our newsroom should hold the opinion that the election was illegitimate? No, I don't think so. Because the evidence says it was legitimate. Thanks, uh, Alfred. Um, Marty, we're, we're just about out of time here, but I, you know, I'm so curious because you have been completely absorbed in your work for 45 years. You're, you're as, uh, as uh, passionate a newsman as uh, there, there is out there. Um, how, how is the separation going? And, uh, <laughs> okay. and, 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 and I know you've signed a book contract. Tell me, tell me a little bit about what you're, you're planning to do. Right. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's, the separation's going okay. I mean, I feel like I was ready for it. I thought a lot about it. Uh, but I have actually been pretty busy uh, because, you know, I had to write a proposal for a book and I didn't have to, but I did. I wanted to. Uh, and uh, and and now I have, you know, a contract uh, to do that. And um, and so I've been pretty busy at that. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. I mean, it'll cover my eight years at The Washington Post and uh, certainly that Trump, the Trump period, the Bezos period. Uh, but it'll also include um, uh, look back at some of the stories that we touched on here in this conversation, the Catholic Church investigation and what the lessons are from that, the 2000 presidential election and what the lessons are from that, the Elian Gonzalez uh, case, um, and, um, and what, you know, what, the, you know what, what, what we can draw from that. Um, and uh, it'll look back at the NSA case, which was while I was at the Washington Post, the NSA stories, the Snowden stories, um, which came before Trump. Uh, so it'll cover a lot of territory. So it's going to keep me really busy. And, and then I'll be involved in other things. Um, I'm doing a fair amount of speaking. I, uh, I may get involved in some other ventures that we'll see. I'll wait and see. I haven't committed to them yet, uh, but I've been proposed, I've kind of various entities have proposed them to me. So I have to think about just how busy I want to be. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to have I, I'm not going to have a problem being busy I've, that I've discovered in the short time yeah. that I've retired. Yeah. Your problem may be trying not to be busy. Um, I, I think it's turning out to be the case. I just want to say uh, in the research that um, <laughs> was done for me uh, to prepare for this and a previous uh, uh, sit down we had, there was this quote that I wanted to read on the way out. Uh, from uh, Jeff Brazil, a, a reporter who worked with you at the LA Times or for you at the LA Times. Uh, 
when you had a you know when you were a senior editor there and um, there are universal characteristics often used to define great editors intelligence determination fearlessness news instincts an unwavering moral and ethical compass a fierce competitive drive a tireless work ethic and even a touch of compassion some editors possess a few of these traits maybe several but marty baron has all of those things and all these things add up to something that's almost magical what a wonderful what a wonderful um assessment of your career and um uh, it, it's reflected in the work that the people who worked under you and with you uh produced you 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 helped them do great work and that great work helped change uh, the country for the better so uh thank you for that thank you for for being here thank you for honoring uh, the memory of the broders uh, by being here. I think they would uh, have uh, liked the conversation and can't wait to read the book. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, David. Thank you to the Broder family and thank you to the IOP.